On behalf of the Asia Society Policy Institute, we welcome you to our webinar tonight and the launch of our new ASPE paper on trade that examines the next generation trade challenges with a focus on developments in Asia. And at the outset, I would really like to thank Citi for supporting this project and making it possible. So before we get into the program, um, I thought I'd just spend a few minutes and share some important takeaways from our report that was drafted by Shay Wester of my team. I think he did a great job in synthesizing into one paper all of the developments and evolutions, not only on the global um, trade scene, but also the regional trade scene over the past 70 years or so. And looking back on, on these years, we all have to be impressed that global trade flows have grown to unprecedented levels, facilitated by the lowering of tariffs and the elimination of many non-tariff measures. And the economies of Asia have just been front and center in this remarkable growth, with Asian trade volumes growing nearly or nearly quadrupling over the past 20 years alone. There is no doubt that Asian economies have benefited from an open rules-based multilateral trading system. This, is, this trading system and the trade that they have conducted has con contributed to their economic growth, economic development, lifted millions out of poverty, and created jobs. But the system is facing serious challenges today including the weakening of the WTO's negotiating and dispute settlement functions, the emergence of geopolitical disputes, the weaponization of trade, and the emergence of new and multilateral actors, making it really difficult to achieve consensus on issues going forward. And at the same time, the substantive agenda has involved, particularly due to success achieved in substantially reducing barriers at the border. And new agenda items that the trade world is dealing with are complex and not subject to easy solutions. In our report, we identify five next generation trade challenges that already are and will continue to be front and center in the months and years ahead. <laughs> These five issues will come no surprise to my trade colleagues. They include the digital economy, which continues to substantially transform how and what we trade, the role of trade in addressing climate change challenges, the importance of economic inclusion and in ensuring that everyone benefits from trade in our society, the emergence of economic security matters encompassing topics like resilient supply chains, export controls, and economic coercion, and the increasing use of non-market economy practices, which have resulted in major distortions in trade and investment. Our report shares four concluding thoughts to help navigate meaningful progress on these matters, recognizing that the traditional approaches we have been following may not be sufficient. First, um, there's a focus look going forward on more targeted agreements instead of comprehensive agreements, focusing on specific sectors or issues. We're also seeing the emergence of smaller groupings of like-minded countries, either on a formal or an ad hoc basis, working together, together to break new ground. There's also an exploration of new mechanisms recognizing the reality that trade agreements take a long time to negotiate and put into effect at the same time when technology is, is moving at unprecedented speeds. And finally, implementing governmental restructuring um, to better address and, um, and meet the demands of the trading landscape. So together with these existing mechanisms, these fresh approaches could help create a new foundation of rules on the pressing issues of digital climate, inclusivity, economic security, and non-market economy practices. The hope would be that ultimately they would serve as stepping stones or building blocks to a more inclusive and sustainable multilateral outcomes while avoiding the current drift towards fragmentation. 
But that unfortunately still remains an open question. So now on to our program. To discuss all of these issues, we've convened a, a very impressive group of panelists who collectively, I think, have spent over 100 years, and maybe if you include me in that, maybe 200 years <laughs> working on trade issues. Um, these are all close colleagues of mine through the years and mentors, and I'm grateful that they found the time to join us this evening. But before we learn more about them and start the conversation, I'm pleased to be joined by Candy Wolf of City, who will moderate this session. At City, she's responsible for its government affairs efforts in the United States and internationally. And she has extensive experience in both the private sector and the public sector, working in the White House as assistant to President George W. Bush for legislative affairs, as well as ser serving uh, in senior staff positions in the U.S. Senate. So with that, over to Candy, and um, I will see you soon. I would just add that later in the program, we will be taking questions from the audience. So please don't wait until the end. Use the chat box or the Q&A box um, to present your questions, and hopefully we can get to some of them. Over to you, Candy. Great. Thank you, Wendy. And, and um, thank you to the Asia Society and to Shay for all of his efforts with respect to, to this uh, wonderful report that we're launching. Um, and again, uh, good morning, good evening to everyone joining us for this webinar. I think it's uh, not an understatement to say that the future of trade is changing and that we're witnessing a formation of new trade groupings and agreements. For many global firms like Citi that, at, that are at the center of global trade, this is an opportunity to modernize and adapt trade rules to today's interconnected world and build a more resilient and inclusive future. The Asia Society report sponsored by Citi predicts, as we just heard from Wendy, that smaller bilateral and regional FTAs will be the way forward for the moment to harness the economic growth that trade has always offered and make progress on some of our newer and more pressing challenges that we heard Wendy outline, such as economic inclusion for workers and small businesses, economic security and supply chain resiliency, climate change, digital transformation. Looking beyond the headlines of deglobalization and fragmentation, we are seeing some real progress made, especially in Asia Pacific, as markets are attempting to strengthen their connections and collectively raise their resiliency. These deals are fostering broader cooperation and setting precedent. Beyond lowering tariffs, these economies are negotiating on a smaller scale to overcome and address some of the issues that have halted broad reaching global trade deals in the rest of the world. Would these new trade initiatives be the age for trade? And will traditional trade liberalizing FTA still be prominent? Those are some of the questions that we're going to probe tonight. Um, and we have an excellent panel to be able to probe those questions. So I am pleased, so pleased to be joined by such an illustrious group of trade experts with, as Wendy said, 200 years of uh, experience. Um, so I'd like to uh, make our introductions. We have the Honorable Tim Grozer, who is the current chair and founder of Grozer and Associates, which is a trade and climate change consultancy. He is New Zealand's former ambassador to the United States and special envoy to the Pacific Alliance. He's also New Zealand's former minister of trade and climate change and the administrator of the TPP negotiations. He's been a member of parliament and ambassador to the WTO and so many other things that are too numerous to list. We also have the Honorable Hang Ku Yo, a non-resident distinguished fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute. Uh, Yo capped off almost three decades of public service as trade minister of the Republic of Korea in the final year of the Moon JN presidency. He's been involved in numerous bilateral and multilateral trade negotiations from most recently CPTPP to even IPEF and many before that. We also have Elizabeth Liz Chelia, who is currently Singapore's principal trade specialist at the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Elizabeth has covered a range of portfolios over her, her 27 years in service. This includes WTO issues, commencing from her posting 
to Singapore's trade mission in Geneva. She has extensive involvement in FTA negotiations since 2002. And finally, we have Ambassador Kurt Tong, the managing partner and member of the executive committee of the Asia Group, a consulting firm focused on Japan, China, and Hong Kong, and on the East Asia regional policy matters. Ambassador Tong brings 30 years of experience in the Department of State as a career foreign service officer and member of the Senior Foreign Service. And prior to joining the Asia Group, Ambassador Tong served as Consul General and Chief of Mission in Hong Kong and the CAP. So with that, um, we're gonna kick off uh, a moderated discussion. And as Wendy just said, please send in your questions so that uh, we can uh, have some input and, and hear from you in, in terms of what you'd like to hear. So let's begin. Um, I'm gonna start with Tim for, for the first part of the discussion. Tim, you were present at the creation of what is now the CPTPP, or originally the TPP, and we have more letters. Uh, and in fact, the seeds were planted with a strategy paper that you wrote in 1998, proposing an FTA with Singapore. At the time, you were worried about APEC losing momentum as focus shifted in the WTO, a lack of coherence as FTAs proliferated, and about a, U a US unwilling to provide leadership on international trade. And you wrote, and I will quote, that New Zealand is not content to sit and wait to un for events to unfold and hope that all goes well. So if we look back, how did the P4 and the TPP address some of the emerging issues at the time? And then we can kind of talk about how it's evolved. Well, thank you very much, Candy, and um, hi to everybody else. Um, I've been looking forward to this uh, panel now for a week or two. The original impetus of this was that, uh, first of all, New Zealand strongly needs further liberalisation because we export 95% of our agricultural output and it coincides with some of the most severe restrictions anywhere in world trade. So while the Uruguay round made a very, very important step forward for the first time putting operationally effective rules around agriculture, because it was limited in its liberalization, there was always intended to be what was called a continuation clause. We would not stop there, we'd carry on. But as the 1990s progressed, I became increasingly concerned about the erosion of support inside the US Democratic Party and was becoming more and more skeptical that the Seattle round would be successfully launched. And boy, do I remember the battle at Seattle that saw that hope extinguished. So I thought we needed a plan B. At the same time, I was also um, a total skeptic about not the concept of the Bogle goals for achieving in economic integration in the Asia Pacific, but the absolute lack of realism around putting forward an objective without any a realistic operational plan to realize it, just this oxymoron called concerted unilateralism. And I knew that Japan and the United States would never unilaterally liberalize a damned single tariff line. So I thought the way forward was to put together a small coalition of countries to try and deal with reality of Asia Pacific integration. And I remembered reading when I was foreign policy advisor to the prime minister some years previously, a wonderful speech that Lee Kuan Yew had made to the joint houses of Congress in which he wanted to respond to the openness of the United States for the first time to a bilateral FTA, but on the other hand was constrained politically by the need to retain ASEAN solidarity. And I thought, well, maybe 15 years on, let's test the Singaporeans again. So I wrote that paper you referred to. Giorgio was the trade minister. He read it. He told me that um, the prime minister told his entire cabinet to read it. And they said, yes. Now, look, it had nothing to do with trade between New Zealand and Singapore. It was only a device to try to operationalize the involvement of the United States in the process of a realistic plan to achieve greater economic uh, integration in what we then called the Asia Pacific. And now we've decided for reasons that slightly escape me to rebadge it, the Indo-Pacific. So that's the background to it. And then it just grew like topsy. And when I then uh, joined the dark side and went into politics uh, and worked with Mike Froman and uh, the Obama administration to get the United States to mount 
what had always been the Singaporean Chilean idea, a US takeover of it, it worked extremely well. But then we got the the um the slow erosion of further support, both with well, largely within the US Democratic Party, frankly. Um, and then the Trump phenomenon and the takeover of the traditional Republican uh, position on trade by the Trump anti-trade forces. And I remember I was sitting in on the floor of Congress as the ambassador watching a um, bemused Paul Ryan witness the Trump unilateral withdrawal uh, from TPP and all those years of work I thought had gone down the tube. But fortunately, that was wrong judgment. Japan, in a remarkable display of uh, political leadership as the dominant economic power left, took up the challenge. And that's what led to CPTPP. And now we've got still real momentum behind it. I mean, I'm sure we'll get on to the question of where does that leave the United States and the IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework um, Agreement in particular. But we have two um, very important applications to join from the UK and from China. And those are some very interesting geostrategic questions, which uh, I'll, I'll stop at that point, Candy. Are you sure you don't want to answer the question of do you think that they will be uh, joining? Well, of course I want to answer, but there are other participants <laughs> in the conversation. So uh, let's, let's just um, leave aside any, any detail on this. I think it is um, all but certain that the United Kingdom, provided they can overcome some relatively modest opposition inside uh, the House of Lords and the House of Commons to the um, extraordinarily uh, high level FTAs that have been negotiated between an independent post-Brexit UK and Australia and New Zealand, they will get into CPTPP. And this is not a small point because Whatever your personal views were on Brexit, one argument used by the anti-Brexit forces is clearly ridiculous, that it, Britain is just a small island country. Well, Britain is the fifth largest economy in the world. The United States' largest single export market is Canada. The UK is $1 trillion larger than Canada. So having the fifth largest country comes in adds not only heft, but it changes the nature of CPTPP from a regional agreement, whether you call it Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific is of no consequence, uh, into a regional agreement of rules and frameworks. And that's, that's potentially very large strategic consequences for the WTO down the track. As for China, well, that is the biggest single question in my country's uh, and I'm sure Australia's vision as to what are we going to do to handle the China application? One thing I can tell you, it will be treated with respect and extremely seriously. With that, why don't we um, hold the follow-up questions and we'll probably dig a little deeper um, into the question of, of of China's engagement, but um, I'd like to go over to uh, Han Ku now and talk a little bit about Korea. Uh, Han Ku, you've, you've seen and, and have been active, Korea's been active across many of, of the next generation challenges uh, facing trade agreements, and particularly with respect to the digital front, and we can say the same for Singapore, of course, as well. Um, but uh, Korea concluded an agreement with Singapore when you were minister and is now in the final stages of joining DEPA. And Seoul has been active on climate and supply chain and economic security issues that are part of the discussion today. Um, so what do you see as the biggest next generation challenge to trade in Asia and globally? And what do you think presents itself as the biggest opportunity if it were to be addressed effectively through trade agreements. So challenges and uh, opportunities. And thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you, uh, Candy. And I, I'd like to thank to Asia Society for, for this wonderful, e uh, wonderful event and also uh, the excellent uh, report. Um, 
I think you know the trade environment is really uh, going through paradigm shift uh, from more traditional uh, this market liberalizing of uh, the trade policy to uh, really all these new challenges uh, outlined by this report you know, supply chain economic security etc and then um, actually in Asia uh, this uh, the CPTPP RCEP and IPEP has been uh, really kind of a uh, uh, move, moving forward, uh, this the overall scene of trade in the Asia Pacific. Let me, I, I got involved in all these three uh, for the last 10 years. So let me provide my uh, perspective on these three. I think first, um, you know, CPTPP, uh, as Tim uh, really elaborate on the birth of the CPTPP, I think obviously it's a high standard. And, uh, you know, in terms of liberalization, it's, it's uh, deeper and then also higher. Uh, but also, I think it could be more inclusive. Actually, you know, U.S. is out, Korea is out, and also, you know, only three out of ten ASEAN countries are into the CPTPP. So I think it can be more inclusive by handling these accession issues more strategically. Okay, and then uh, on RCEP, um, actually, I was uh, in the RCEP uh, conference about three weeks ago. Uh, celebrating uh, the 10th uh, year of inception of RCEP. I think RCEP may not be as high as that of CPTPP, but I think it's more diverse. It includes 10 ASEAN countries, and also it's more inclusive. And um, actually, I found the one um, interesting anecdote evidence uh, from the conference that I mentioned. Actually, when we look at um, for the last about uh, you know, seven months of implementation of RCEP, uh, we look at the data uh, between the trade between Korea and China. And then we find um, more and more businesses are using this RCEP, um, although the tariff level on specific uh, tariff line are lower in the bilateral FTA. The reason was that uh, the rules of origin and RCEP is, is more uh, simplified and more business friendly compared to all these uh, different complex uh, network of bilateral, this ROO. So I, I think in that sense, I think RCEP could also uh, play a meaningful role uh, in will be connecting all the supply chain in the region. But also we have to recognize that all these CPTPP and RCEP are getting out of data. Uh, even CPTPP is, is getting like seven years, uh, you know, since the, the rule was mm -hmm. formulated at first. So, and also, I think this all these new emerging trade issues that we talk about, uh, RCEP and T CPTPP are not very well equipped to, you know, grapple with these new uh, challenges. So in that sense, I think IPEP uh, could uh, play a role in developing some new types of uh, initiative uh, covering supply chain decarbonization and digital, etc. So, um, the you know Co Korea is a part of this IPEF, and uh, we we are you know, conscious of the um, you know some of the, uh, the complaint about this IPEF that there is no this market access elements. But I think how to design uh, these new uh, challenging issues. Uh, of supply chain and decarbonation, I think that could really uh, make a difference uh, in this IPEF. So I, I'll stop here and come back later. Thank you. Thank you. So Liz, maybe we'll um, go over to you now to, to talk uh, a bit about uh, Singapore. The report highlights some of the new and innovative agreements that have been underway in Asia and predicts we're likely to see more of these targeted issue specific approaches. And Singapore has really been at the forefront here, as we, as we know, with several digital economy agreements uh, and recently signing the first of its kind green economy agreement with Australia. So from, from Singapore's perspective, why have you focused on these particular issues or what have you found as sort of the best approach, you know, to, to, for these more targeted approaches rather than some of these broader agreements? And um, how would you or how are you thinking about their impact so far? Assessing it might be a little broad since things were just signed, but you know, it, if, if you could speak a bit to, to the, the targeted nature 
and and also what you think are sort of the the, the value propositions of, of this particular approach. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening to everybody, and good morning for those who are in this part of the world. I think Singapore has been very uh, unique and fortunate. The traditional FTAs, which focus a lot on market access, liberalization, be it for goods, services, and investment. We are really, really fortunate to have such agreements with all our trading partners. We have a 27 FTAs, a recovering, you know, all our key trade partners, as well as emerging and new trade partners. So we've got the market access to a certain extent covered, both bilaterally, the bilateral agreements that Singapore has, as uh, Tim said, we started off with New Zealand and we've just gone on uh, to do more and more. And then ASEAN as well. ASEAN decided to have plus one with dialogue partners. And then we were in CPTPP, RCEP, and now we are also exploring uh, IPEP. So with a lot of the market access issues already covered by these pre-existing uh, agreements and businesses then having that competitive market access advantage, the question was, what next? And so we were at the turn where digitalization, the fourth IR was becoming, you know, on stream and everyone was looking at it. Unfortunately, with a bit of trepidation, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in Singapore, we started to have um, commentaries as to say how the robots will take away your job and you won't have, you know, anything to do and stuff like that. So we had a very, uh, a minister, Minister Iswaran, with a lot of foresight, he said, why don't we try and harness the digital uh, opportunities the same way that we have done for traditional trade issues in FTAs. And that kick-started uh, the digital economy uh, adventure and experimentation. So the first one, experimentation, was the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement with New Zealand. New Zealand is usually our partner in a lot of this uh, experimentation that takes place. And then with Chile, all three of us are small, open and the same way that we also started the P4, we were looking for new ways in which to harness this new uh, fourth industrial revolution. So businesses will look at it more positively. There'll be more jobs created by you looking into all of this and what then do we need to do? It is also um, noted that, you know, if you can have like a deep dive into this issue without market access, maybe we could even go deeper and broader because in traditional FTAs, there's too much trade-offs. Like, am I going to open my market access tariffs? Uh, and then maybe if I can't agree to what your regulatory reform is, maybe you will not. And there's a lot of ajibaji that way. So by just focusing on digital itself and identifying what we needed to do to enhance the usage of cross-border digitalization, you know, ranging from paperless trade. You know, Singapore was at the forefront of this even back in the 80s with our trade net system, and then we have single windows. So how do we get more and more connected? How do we build trust and confidence in business that their digital documents can be used? How to have digital payments? What do you mean by data privacy, and all of this was done with a way to try and get businesses to have uh, assurance that if they are doing digital um, business with cross-border, then how are they going to be protected? What is the competitive edge that they might have? And so thankfully, DIPA started off well. And for DIPA, we also then didn't make it a binding subject to dispute because we wanted to have that sandbox effect so that everyone could think about what was going through and then as it evolved, what would you want to make it as a regulatory coherence for the DEPA members. So just like P4, DEPA has an open accession provision and we're glad to see others uh, indicating interest in joining and Korea almost at the end. Then this spun off into other bilateral uh, digital economy agreements where with some countries where they wanted to focus a deep dive on other areas. So with Australia, we do a little bit more on finance with the UK, you know, so there are different interests going on. And the, the main aim is to try and get people to look at digitalization positively, 
scraps the metal and see how it can facilitate and provide a competitive advantage. And as from the negotiator point, how to be able to just trade off or negotiate amongst the range of digitalization issues rather than having to trade off with other non-digital issues that you would have to do if it was in an FTA, for example. We would have had the choice to probably deepen the e-commerce chapter in CPTPP, but that would have opened up a lot of other issues where you know maybe the CPTPP partners would not be willing to do so unless their issues of interest in other chapters were addressed. And so we started this focus approach. Thankfully, it's doing well. In my current role at SBF, I also help try and explain all this to business. And business is paying a lot more attention because it provides some sort of certainty. Some commentators have already said there's a spaghetti ball of digital regulation. So our agreements try and pave the way for certainty. Like, are you going to use data privacy? What is the standard? What is the assurance? How do you get um, it to be recognized the other side so that you tick the boxes? What sort of security, digital trust do you need to put into place? E-invoicing standards, we have adopted the people. So all of this helps business as they navigate. And COVID, I would say, provided a real acceleration because we were already used to doing things online. And then the digitalization when a lot of um, domestic laws had to be changed to recognize digital uh, documentation so that you can enforce because businesses, of course, need to have uh, pathways in which they can enforce an agreement. So if you are telling them, oh, send your contracts via email and then you don't provide the way for the courts to recognize this, then they're not going to really adopt it. So thankfully, we'll be able to, with our fellow experimenters, take this issue forward. And we're quite glad to see a lot more wanting to join and partake in this uh, so maybe I can't call it an experiment has already moved into the next phase. So then what is the newest experiment that we have started is the Green Economy Agreement. Now, the Green Economy Agreement is more like a framework. It brings together a host of uh, green economy issues, climate change issues, energy transition issues. And for those uh, trade nerds who are listening in, you will recall that we've been trying to do an environmental goods liberalization for years. APEC succeeded with 54 products. We went to the WTO and unfortunately we didn't uh, manage to conclude it as a pre-lateral WTO agreement akin to the ITA. But what we have done now in the SAGEA is to give you a reference list so that if you're wanting to embark on it, be in your own bilateral arrangement or bring it back to the WTO or expand the APEC list, you already have like a reference list of what Singapore and Australia has identified and categorized as green uh, goods. We also have a list for green services. And let's see how it takes off from here. It's only just... Uh, been uh, signed barely a month ago. And so, as you said, let's watch the page. Let's see how we take this new approach as well, because I said it's a framework with many, many 17 annexes, which actually are the work streams and see who else is keen to take up on this. Maybe um, looking towards the US, you're hosting APAC as well next year. Maybe you can look at the reference list if you all are thinking of re-embarking and expanding the APEC environmental goods list. I'll stop here for now. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. And um, I'd like to turn to Kurt um, for a moment. And uh, Kurt, you sort of come at this from a you know, foreign policy perspective and, and the importance of trade as we look at, at foreign policy. But you know, we've seen a couple of different things, skepticism, around the benefits of trade certainly have grown. And I, and I think as Tim noted, you know, that's been part of the challenge in the U S in terms of getting, getting votes and support. Um, and also the need for a more inclusive trade uh, policy. But, you know, as I listen to the discussion going on here and all of the involvement in Asia, I do feel a bit like the U S is left out um, or that we, that the U.S. has been slow to sort of re-engage, and IPEF seems to be part of that effort. Um, but I guess I would, would sort of ask you in a very general way, you know, sort of looking across this, do, do you think that the U.S. is losing ground in the region? Do we need to be, you know, does the U.S. need to be more engaged? And, and you know, what do you see as some of the, 
the sort of the challenges in terms of having for the U.S. engagement just in the political environment, since trade seems to be such a, a negative word these days. So a broad question, but over to you. Well, well, <laughs> and thank you great. for joining thanks, us. Thanks, Candy. That's a, uh, an excellent question. Um, before I respond, I do want to just give my congratulations to, to Shay and to ASPI for the really very high quality report. And, and if people on this uh, Zoom have not read it, I highly recommend it. I think it's really quite a, a nice, concise piece of work that explains where things are and and reflect a lot of the comments we've already heard tonight in terms of the direction of, of trade policy over the next few years. So is the US losing ground? Um, Two answers to this question. Politically, yes, absolutely. As po politics is based on perceptions, and geopolitics is the same as domestic politics. And the perception in the Indo-Pacific region is that the U.S. government has dealt itself out of a leadership position by removing itself from TPP and not participating in any other comprehensive um, trade agreements. Now, we'll probably get into discussion in a few minutes about, about the, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which has some significant merit to it and could end up surprising people, um, you know, kind of like Wales scoring a goal against the United States late in the second half. The U.S. may, in fact, um, do a little bit of a reputational comeback through the IPEF. But the, but the short answer is, yes, the U.S. is losing ground politically as a government. Um, the United States as an economy, I think the answer is, is a little more optimistic that the U.S. private sector is well positioned to take advantage of the liberalization and market opening that has been taking place and continuing to take place uh, in the region, absent, even absent U.S. leadership. And I think that's an important distinction and 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 is something that people should keep in mind that the, that as these agreements trend more and more in the direction of trying to directly, um, through public-private partnerships or other mechanisms, bring private sector into the room in shaping the, the desired outcomes, um, that the U.S. could be, and I think probably will be, a very significant player. Now, just for half a minute, um, for, the, for the benefit of anyone on, on this, this call who's not an American, um, there are four political parties in the United States, um, two Democratic parties and two Republican parties. The larger half of the Republican Party is anti-trade. Um, the smaller half of the Democratic Party is anti-trade. Um, the two parties in the middle could, could theoretically get together and, and rebuild some kind of consensus around trade, but they hate each other. So the problem is, is as uh, uh, Ambassador Grosser was describing, is a severe one and deals the United States um, out of the situation for the time being. This could change um, as political um, alignments change. So what I think will happen, and as, as is reflected in the ASPE report, these trade agreements going forward are going to be more focused are going to focus less on trying to figure out past problems or currently existing market access problems and more focused on how do we shape economies in a direction of desired public goods? Because the difficulty, and, and this I think is reflected in Liz's comment about where they've taken this green economy initiative in revisiting these difficult past issues in a comprehensive agreement framework is, is it's really challenging as the complexity grows to to address those in a binding framework and in many ways it makes more sense to try and resolve these thorny market access issues bilaterally just through um tug of war and and leverage approaches in a in a bilateral context trying to uh, get at those at those issues and instead i think that the the more formal especially the multilateral agreements will be more focused on on uh, public goods, whether that's in the area of climate, uh, in the area of health, or in the area of quote unquote inclusiveness. Now the last thing I want to say is that in that sense, can these agreements be um, distributive? 
So what, what a lot of what you hear in the United States is when people say inclusive trade agreements, they mean agreements that somehow um, result in a, a redistribution of wealth to um, within the, the economy. That's very difficult to uh, achieve through an international agreement. Very, very difficult. Uh, and the the rhetoric that pushes against trade agreements and against globalization push, points to the idea that that the wealthy get wealthier and and disadvantaged groups do not under a globalization situation. But trying to address that through an agreement which is positive sum, very difficult. What these agreements can do, in my opinion, is be creative, not distributive, but but opportunity creative by focusing on how do you create more uh, opportunities for um, groups who have not been actively participating in international trade uh, or um, smaller companies who can take advantage of the digital economy or e-commerce to become uh, internationally active or focus through public-private partnership and some um, uh, incentives from government focus economies more in the direction of desired green economy outcomes by tilting the playing field um, and making it and creating opportunity through trade agreements um, uh, in that respect. So I, I think that's an important distinction to make when we talk about what the public policy goals are that, that these agreements will focus on going forward is, is if they're creating opportunities, that is, that's going to be more realistic. If they're trying to, to redistribute resources away from currently successful segments of economies, much more difficult to make progress. So let me stop there. Thank you, Kurt. Um, Wendy, I think I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of take us into IPEF and probably some of the discussion we need to have around that and uh, uh, and any questions that you think have sort of come in from the from the audience at this point. Sure. And I, I just want to thank all the panelists for the first round of discussion. You put so many issues on the table. So let's get to IPEC. IPEF and, and actually APEC, the APEC host year for the United States, because the way I look at it, these are kind of the two pillars of the Biden administration's economic engagement plan for the Indo-Pacific for the next two years. Um, and I'd be curious, partic particularly from um, hearing from um, our non-US panelists, how do you evaluate each um, and if you think there are shortcomings, for example, in IPEF, what advice would you offer the Biden administration? And with respect to our APEC host year, what should the U.S. put on the agenda, particularly at a time when APEC has gone through some rough years um, and there have been um, you know, some sharp divisions between some key countries on agenda items? Um, are there things that that can be worked on, maybe as, as Kurt phrased them, some of these public good items, and I would add maybe food security to that, where we could make some real progress in APEC during the coming year? So, Tim, maybe I'll st start with you. IPEF and APEC, APEC, what do you think? Well, first of all, I think Kurt made some very, uh, very important comments in his analysis, and I agree 100% with the thrust of his comments. I, I strongly support IPEF, uh, but more out of a hope of what it might evolve into. I mean, I could paint you a negative view of IPEF if it was captured by those forces in the United States that want to you know, literally force the decoupling issue it will not work. It's not just Germany. You recall Olaf Scholz's recent statement that decoupling from China is not on the German agenda. That would be identical for Australia and New Zealand. China is our largest single export market, far more important to our international trading economy than the United States. Complete decoupling is off the table um, in my view. But I'm going to take a more optimistic view, more in line with Kurt's view about where it may move. Now, Right now, it stood there as filling a vast political gap for the reasons Kurt outlined. Um, the United States cannot just have a military strategic game in the Asia-Pacific or the Indo-Pacific. It's got to have an economic gain. The withdrawal of the United States, essentially, unfortunately, a bipartisan basis, 
um, left a giant hole. IPEF is a political device to start to answer that question. Now, where will it go? I've given you a, a negative view. I, I, I don't think that's the future of it. And I rather take um, a longer term, more optimistic view. Let's just remember, bearing in mind Kurt's point about there are actually four political parties. It's all a question about how the political leadership of the United States, the indispensable country here in this discussion, actually handles the politics of this. The last trade bill to be presented to the US Congress, which was the refresh of the NAFTA, flew through the United States Congress. I even remember the vote. It was 385 votes on in the House in favor of it, out of what, 454, is it, um, House members. I mean, a massive bipartisan uh, expression of support. So the task facing, I mean, the numerous really smart people in this administration, um, they understand all this, but they don't have the political base to move forward quite yet and try to work the IPF initiative in the right direction. But it's all a matter, in my opinion, of framing it in the right strategic uh, context. And ultimately, this is going to be about China. I hope I'm going to stick my neck out here that with the meeting between President Biden and President Xi in Jakarta, we've reached what I call peak madness in the US-China strategic relationship, but it's gonna be a long walk back from that point. And I think um, I'll take um, a long-term optimistic view of IPEF. Uh, I am skeptical that the issue of trade liberalization can be avoided forever for numerous reasons, not, not the least of which is what's gonna happen when India becomes a significant player in the international trading system. India sitting on top, would you believe, an average bound tariff rate of 112%. I mean, the United States is going to accept this? I mean, it gets realistic. So while at the moment there is no political base for Catherine Tai and the other leaders of this administration to move forward on this issue, it's not going to go away. And uh, that's the reason I strongly support IPEF. Liz, maybe I can follow up on that, because I thought you had mentioned earlier that in Singapore and pursuing digital and green agreements is recognizing that some of these market access issues, you know, may not be as important as tariffs are lowered um, and other access is provided. How important do you think market access is um, in IPAF in order, you know, particularly with respect to your other ASEAN um, colleagues, um, do you think the U.S. can offer enough incentives for your uh, for other ASEAN colleagues to sign on um, to the four pillars, um, not only to negotiate but also to outcomes, substantial outcomes from all four pillars? Okay, thanks, um, Wendy. I will just give you my personal view. I think, so as I said just now, Singapore is very fortunate in that we've got such a myriad range of FTAs that all address market access. So for Singapore and Singapore business, there's too much choice. And so not having market access in a newer agreement or in the initiatives you're doing doesn't really trouble our business too much because they have other pathways to adopt if they want to seriously pursue the market access. On that note, even in ASEAN, we are upgrading the Artiga for the market access. We are upgrading ASEAN China. We are looking at ASEAN India. So that's why for Singapore, we can also then concurrently pursue a lot of other um, interests which do not have market access because market access is taken care of elsewhere. So in response to your question, then I guess would be for the other IPEF members, to what extent are they also covered in a way by these market access initiatives such that they can then use IPEF to really focus on what is the other barrier, which is regulations, the non-tariff measures. So in many FTAs, because there's so much focus on market access, you will realize that we don't really... Um, tick the box very well in addressing the non-tariff measures, the regulatory coherence, the other issues that you might want to really look at to have harmonization for supply chains to facilitate all of this. And so to me, this is where IPEF, if handled well, 
could actually provide that. And, you know, uh, amongst friends, we have also noted that actually this is where IPEF dovetails very well with APEC because APEC actually doesn't really talk too much about market access. I mean, Tim on the BOGO goals is correct. I'm at the last I. APEC year I did was 2010 when we did the midterm assessment of the BOGO goals and we were there. far from moving, you know, anywhere near zero tariffs for uh, any one of us except maybe for Singapore, but then we still have four tariff lines. And so how then do you harness and facilitate uh, how businesses can operate on the regulatory coherence front, which are, is also issues we had started discussion at APEC, we took forward in CPTPP, but you know we may not be going too far in CPTPP now because of the um, lack of business engagement in identifying what is it that they want. So I have hopes that IPEF and together with APEC and that with the US hosting APEC next year, it really provides an opportunity to tell business how this is all trying to get you to be able to operate better by looking at the regulations, the non-tariff measures, which are actually still impeding, even when market access is at preferential zero. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I think when it comes, at least my experience, when the U.S. participated in negotiations, we spent a lot of time on non-tariff measures and regulatory issues as well. Um, but um, I just I leave you I think the that. U.S. is a bit unique in that. Yeah. Yeah. Others are overly focused on the market access. Yeah. You know, and yeah. then as I'm doing the outreach with business, we find that it's very hard for us to overcome the non tariff measures, you see. So let's yeah. hope we have a bit more push for that and mm -hmm. hoping for the best, especially since you have a supply chain pillar where all of this will, you know, be brought together in a way. Great transition for Han Ku, because I know Korea has been very supportive of IPEF under your leadership and now under the leadership of the new trade minister. And particularly with respect to supply chain resiliency, um, Korea has been very active um, on that front, working with a number of countries to establish resilient supply chains, including um, concluding an MOU with China recently on supply chain resiliency. So how do you see the supply chain outcome of IPEF developing? Do you think there's prospect for even early harvest with respect to maybe an early warning mechanism or some kind of crisis management um, mechanism? Mm -hmm. uh, that's an excellent question. I can respond in hours. But we, we have only... Well, let's like, do the, the four-minute version. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I think uh, I see that IPEF, uh, I have a more optimistic view of IPEF. I, I think IPEF could be a good tool for not just this new type of trade policy, but also for industrial and climate change, energy transition policy. Um, uh, let me be a bit more specific. I think uh, these days this uh, Inflation Reduction Act of the United States. Uh, it's a really landmark innovative legislation with all these, uh, these EV, uh, electric vehicles and battery, uh, all this promotion. But actually there is a one kind of uh, the provision that many countries are paying attention to because right now I, IRA it requires critical materials to be sourced from US or uh, FTA partner. So what is the definition of these uh, FTA partners? Right now, most of these IPEP countries are not eligible uh, to make use of this incentive that IRA provide. But if this IPEP could be recognized as equivalent to FTA, uh, then I think um, these mineral, mineral rich countries such as uh, Indonesia, Philippines, and many other ASEAN countries could be eligible to develop this uh, supply chain uh, in cooperation with the United States and other countries in the region. So I think, yes, uh, market access, um, if there is a, a market access element, it's uh, fantastic. But in the absence of, in, in the absence of it, uh, if it could be a bit more creative in providing this kind of powerful incentives to these IPEN member countries uh, in the supply chain pillar, as well as this uh, decarbonization pillar, I think there's uh, many ways in which we could make this uh, iPad a uh, very useful uh, new tool for these newly emerging these uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. So let's start here. 
Kurt, um, the last question to you, having worked with you on APAC in 2011 during our host year, um, now, you know, we're, we're um, a number of years, um, it's, it's a number of years behind, we're hosting again. How would you define success um, for the United States in, in APEC 2023? And do you think our hosting really provides an opportunity for finding areas where we can cooperate with China to um, deliver substantive outcomes? I, I think that following the, um, the meeting of President Biden and President Xi, I'm, I'm a bit more optimistic about the possibility for APEC to, to really have a a nice, solid, substantive agenda in, in 2023. And I hope that that, that is, is the case. There, um, I'm, I'm not expecting to see um, sort of historically um, fantastic breakthrough deliverables in 2023 at APEC, but what I am hoping and expecting to see is some real kind of direction-setting conversations um, in some of these areas where trade and, and, as I was describing, public goods intersect. You mentioned food security. There's a strong history of discussion of that issue in APEC, and and, and that that could be taken up and 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 do some really interesting um, uh, reassurance, sort of mutual reassurance type agreements. Um, discussion about how do you, how do we react to food security crises. That result from geopolitical problems as, as well as from natural natural causes. I don't think it's too soon for the U.S., uh, China, and others to use the APEC forum to start to think about the lessons of COVID. Um, it'll, it'll be controversial, and and China could be very prickly about it, as could the United States and uh, and other countries that are all a little bit defensive about about how various aspects of their of their policy proceeded but perhaps starting a process um, in 2023 in apec with a def defined timeline for figuring out how the the region could perform better next time around i think would be a you know certainly a very very useful thing to do in apec as well um, established uh, uh, to do that and then certainly in the digital space um, that's probably the one that's most closely related to trade where APEC could really accomplish uh, quite a lot by bring, raising the level of government to government dis discussions. And, and certainly the themes that the US intends to put out around inclusive growth uh, and innovative growth fit very well with that idea of, of using the digital economy uh, to, to create more opportunity in, for participation in international trade. So, so I'm, 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 I'm guardedly optimistic about the year and I think there's really potentially a risk uh, rich agenda. I hope people pay a lot of attention and, and give support to their governments during the year. Well, Kurt Tong, you've had the last word, and I love concluding programs with an optimistic note. So thank you. Um, and thanks to all our panelists and to Candy Wolf. I think we've had a great discussion. Um, I think we all agree that we're kind of in a new era of trade. Um, things are changing. Things are evolving. I heard the word, we need to be creative, we need to be forward looking, um, and we need to find ways to cooperate on issues, particularly with respect to issues affecting public goods. And I would close and say, I think um, for me, inclusiveness is really key. Um, as an American, I think for us to really get back in the game on trade, we're gonna have to work harder in the United States to develop an inclusive trade policy. And that doesn't, for me, just mean developing, uh, uh, delivering results. It also means kind of listening um, to folks all around the country from all different walks of life and making them feel that their voices are being heard. And I think our APEC year can provide an enormous opportunity to promote the inclusiveness theme. So with that, thank you very much. Thanks to all our viewers for joining us for this Asia Society Policy Institute event. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.